kaya kunui kaya kurahi um ana i te whakamanua te reo mihi ki a koutou katoa. Thank you to the Auckland Council whānau uh, for welcoming, welcoming me into your whare. Um, I'm humbled to present today as part of the Rimu Insights Speaker Series. Um, I hope that my small contribution adds something to the kite of knowledge um, that Rimu is building to achieve its vision of progressing the interests and aspirations of Māori here in Tāmaki Makaurau. Um, I'd especially like to thank Karina uh, for extending such a warm invitation to me um, and to Anne, the Queen, <laughs> for working alongside Karina um, in the background to finally get me here and to set up this beautiful room so that we're all good to go. Um, uh, I'd also like to thank Autonet, um, uh, Ete Papa, uh, Nau, uh, Tata Tauhui, um, I Whakatū Whera, Nā Reira. Tēnā koe, tēnā koutou katoa. About, about 65 years ago, this famous whakatauwaki by Sir Apirana Ngata was found in some notes that belonged to Bishop Manuhuya Bennett. It reads, E tupu e rea, grow tender shoot, mō ngā rā o tō ao, for the days of your world. Ko tō ringa ki ngā rākau a te pākeha, o te pākeha, your hands to the tool of the pākeha, Hei ora mō tō tinana, for the purpose of your physical well-being. Ko tō ngā kau ki ngā taonga a o tūpuna, your heart to the treasures of your ancestors. Hei tiki tiki mō tō mahunga, as adornment for your head. A ko tō wairua ki te atua, your spirit to the higher power, nā nanei ngā mea katoa, who made all things. I've used this whakatauaki to think about how science and the social come together in the fight for the environment. In this fight, the rākau of the Pākehā is the science, and the taonga of our ancestors is our own knowledge of ourselves, both customary and contemporary. The principal message of this kōrero this morning is that Māori must use science as a strategy to protect the environment and our people, but at the same time we must build our own knowledge of ourselves and the lands and waters to which we connect, because that is where our strength lies. That might sound obvious given Ngata's famous words, but in the business of defending the environment, science is a very dominant form of knowledge, a form of highly valuable and valued capital, as Bourdieu would say, much more so than traditional Māori knowledge. And that fault line where those two knowledges meet Science can be used to dismiss, discredit and devalue Māori in all sorts of ways, in the ways that people think, speak and behave, both overtly and subtly. However, just as much as this dominance is acted upon us, we also internalise it and then we reproduce it. It is part of what Bourdieu termed the habitus. The wonderful thing about this group of people from the Auckland Council coming together is that you are on the front line of where these complexities regarding science, the social and the human condition show up in the context of struggles for the environment hidden in the mundane and the benign. My argument is that we must be able to recognise these things and make them visible, because if we don't, then we can't strategize against them and bring about change. Today, I want to talk through these things using a case study involving the AFCO Meatworks plant in Fielding, about half an hour from Palmerston North. The plant just recently celebrated its centenary and is an important local employer employing 380 staff. Every winter it discharges nearly 80,000 cubic metres of wastewater into the Oroa River, which you can see down here. The wastewater contains blood, fat, meat scraps, detergents, animal faeces and urine. It is screened and then stored in ponds until the solids settle out and then it's discharged into the river via this channel. <clears throat> a 
which is an ephemeral stream, that is a stream that only flows when it rains, called ōtuku. The iwi that have mana whenua, traditional control and authority by virtue of having occupied the lands for several generations, is Ngāti Kaufata. They are defined by the landmarks of their ancestral estate. The Ruahine mountain range, which you can see in the slide behind the plant, um, and the Oraiwa River, which begins in the range and flows through fielding and past the plant. One of the ways in which Kofata's relationship with the river is evident is in the location of their marae. So Aurangi is just across the road from the Afko plant and only about 1k from the river and Kofata, further downstream, is positioned less than a kilometre from the river and directly across from the outlet to the, to the fielding wastewater treatment plant. Te Iwa, a third marae, was demolished in 1936, but there are plans to rebuild it on or near its original site, which is, was about two kilometres from Kofata marae and again close to the river. The Oroa River is a tributary of the Manawatu River, which was famously described as among the worst in the West. Near the confluence of the Oroa and the Manawatu is Te Rangimari e Marae, which belongs to a different iwi, Rangitane. They receive the cumulative effects of the AFCO Meatworks plant and the Fielding Wastewater Treatment plant. So, and their responsibilities as kaitiaki, those who have the genealogical obligation to safeguard the environment and the people for future generations, Ngāti Kofata have to think about the effects of the discharge on their own people as well as on other iwi such as Rangitane and other communities downstream such as those fighting to restore the Manawatu River at Foxton where the river enters the sea. <coughs> because of the AFCO and Fielding wastewater treatment plant discharges, Ngāti Kaufata have not been able to use the river for between 50 and 70 years. <coughs> the old people placed a rahui, a ban or prohibition on the river, sometime between the 1940s and the 1960s. <coughs> rahui are meant to be temporary, but this one has turned out to be permanent. In 2012, a survey of Kofata members found that 92% of Kofata people don't use their river. The small minority who do use it upstream of fielding. In 2015, AFCO applied for a new consent to discharge into the Oroa River for 35 years. Ngāti Kofata engaged me to prepare a cultural impact assessment of the effect of the new discharge on the river and on the people. In November last year, the consent application was heard before a panel of three commissioners. AFCO were present as the applicant as were the Regional Council as the consenting authority. Me and two Kofata representatives presented submissions with others who alongside us were fighting for the discharge to end or at least for the term of the consent to be significantly reduced. Our goal was 10 years. In my submission I referred to the hearing as Timura o te ahi, which is a figure of speech meaning the heat of the battle. I refer to it as such because spaces like the hearing and the whole context in which environmental struggles take place are like battlegrounds. In these spaces, science and the social converge. The first place they converge is in the resource consent application. In AFCO's case, they submitted their application and assessment of environmental effects and 12 appendices. The application and assessment of environmental effects alone was 97 pages and the assessment of effects on the river was 47 pages. At the core of these documents was the science. The applicant's strategy is to use the science to make the argument that the effects of the activity are going to be minimal. Those on the other side of the battleground have to do at least three things, read all the documentation, try to understand it and then use it to help formulate a response that's going to stand up in a hearing 
and help protect the pe- help the people protect the things that matter most to them. Just to give you an idea, it took me 50 hours to read all the documentation and in the process of trying to find out how the new discharge would affect the river and the people, I went to see two scientists, a freshwater scientist and a soil scientist. One of the points that the soil scientists raised with me was that under AFCO's proposal, they would only discharge into the river when the flow was above the median. So there is a lot of water flowing in the river, about 7,500 litres per second. When there's that much water in the river, it dilutes the main pollutants to the point where they only compose a very small proportion of the flow. And his question to me was, if AFCO completely removed their discharge from the river, what difference would that make? When I prepared the cultural impact assessment, I made sure I used as many kaufata sources as I could to build the evidence about the effect of the discharge on them. I've seen other cultural impact assessments that strongly rely on the science, and in my opinion, that is never a strong position for iwi to come from because the science is not able to cover all of the tribe's concerns. It's not holistic enough. One of the main kaufata sources I used was a pr- submission by Professor Sir Mason Jury that set out kaufata's concerns, values and measurements in relation to the Orowa River. These ideas became the anchor stone for the assessment and the main framework against which I evaluated the impacts of the new discharge on the river and on Ngāti Kaufata. Kaufata have three concerns about the river, that it's not safe for swimming, that there has been a decline in fish life, that the state of the river does not allow the people to have an active relationship with the river that then upholds their integrity as indigenous peoples. Kaufata have already imposed culturally specific prohibitions on the recreational use of the river to protect their people, particularly their children and their grandchildren from the potential ill health effects of coming into contact with the water. However, however, they they know these prohibitions don't change the fact that the river is contaminated and it's it's the source of contamination that they want to influence. The concern about fish life reflects the science and the social. The upper river has excellent ecosystem health and supports native fish and trout, but the marae are in the middle reaches about 30 kilometres from the upper reaches where water quality is degraded. Here, the conditions for diverse and abundant fish life are compromised. Nitrate levels are poor, phosphorus levels are very poor, turbidity is increasing, indicating decreasing clarity, and there has been a history of consistent non-compliance with nitrogen and phosphorus standards in the regional plan. Unlike other parts of the Manawatu River catchment, where diffuse discharges from agriculture are the primary source of river degradation, in the Orowa River subcatchment, the main contributors to poor water quality are the point source discharges from the AFCO Meatworks plant and the Fielding Wastewater Treatment Plant. Looking through an Indigenous food security lens at the relationship between poor health of the river, the effect on fish, and Kofata's values for the river, three of the aspects of food security. Oh, Karoha. Access, availability, and utilisation are compromised. Kofata's food security is affected, one, by a lack of access to traditional food which instead of being on the front doorstep, as was intended, is potentially a 30-minute drive away, and two, by limited availability (coughs) due to environmental contamination. The third factor, utilisation, which relates to the nutritional properties of traditional foods, the nutritional properties of traditional foods, ka aroha, has been rendered redundant by the state of the river because the people don't gather food from it. The traditional food option is severely restricted as far as the river goes and these restrictions affect the cultural well-being of the people. 
Collecting food from the river is important in regards to practising manaakitanga or hospitality and upholding the mana or the status of the people. It is also significant in terms of the people knowing the river spatially. For example, where their important places are and why those places are important and in terms of transmitting practical and spiritual knowledge and skills, mātauranga, between the generations. These practices are like a waka, a canoe, a vehicle that carry the cultural and spiritual integrity of the people. The, the river is literally the water that supports the waka and allows it to move. The state of the river has meant that the waka has literally been in storage for a long time and much of the knowledge inside it has become forgotten. Restoring the river, relaunching the waka and revitalising the knowledge and the people are one and the same thing. In participating in the consent process, kaufata are very much looking to shape the future for their children and their grandchildren. They have developed measurements that will tell them when their vision for the river has been achieved. Within a generation they want, a river that is safe for adults and children to swim in, a river that is healthy enough to support diverse and abundant fish life, a river that is uncontaminated in a cultural sense, for example, so that they can source food from it for the marae and for whānau, to be involved in planning, decision making and management, to the extent that they can influence the state of the river and fulfil their role as kaitiaki, and to be regarded by other iwi as upholding the mana and maori of the river, and thus the mana and maori of all other water bodies to which the river is connected. They don't want to wait another 20 or 30 years to achieve those objectives. They want a shortened consent term and to see AFCO progressing towards completely removing the discharge from the river. In preparing the cultural impact assessment, I had to collect evidence about Kofata's relationship with the river and ground the assessment in that evidence. But I had also read some of the science that had been written about the river and the effect of the existing discharge to get a sense of how the proposed discharge would change things or not. When I compared the science with the social, I found that the new discharge would address many of Kofata's concerns for the physical health of the river. For example, it would fall within the one plan targets for E. coli, ammonia, nitrogen and clarity, which would correspond positively with Ngāti Kofata's concerns about recreational safety and fish life and their values for safe use and nutritional properties. However, it wouldn't address Kofata's cultural or spiritual concerns. It was hard to imagine that the people would feel comfortable using the river as a space, as a place of spiritual cleansing, as a place where they could take their children to swim, and as a freshwater and food supply. In a pre-hearing meeting with AFCO, their consultant tried to talk us out of our position by questioning the science we'd used and our scientific knowledge of the river. I found myself being seduced by his points, and I was really lucky that two Kofata people were there to fight for Kofata's position and call the meeting to an end. Unconsciously, I had internalised the dominance of the science coming out of the mouth of a Pākehā man, that inclination being part of the habitus of being colonised and of the value placed on science and the planning process. At the hearing, AFCO's freshwater scientist presented evidence in which he questioned the science that we had used, stating, the reports do not provide an accurate representation of the current state of water quality and freshwater ecology in the Ōrawa River. And the way in which we used his own science, stating, some of these conclusions are incomplete or taken out of context. In addition, their planner recommended weak consent conditions and concluded that after reading the cultural impact assessment, he considered that the effects of the new discharge on Kofata's cultural values were acceptable. I should point out that a five yearly investigative review is an opportunity which is neither compulsory or enforceable, 
In addition, the consent condition for cultural monitoring puts Kofata into conflict with Rangitane because it allows Rangitane to put a stake in Kofata's territory. I can see why the planner wrote the consent condition in that way. He probably wanted, uh, would have wanted to satisfy Kofata and Rangitane aspirations for monitoring the effects of the proposed discharge. But he also possibly didn't understand that there is a struggle going on in the Māori world about who has mana where. The consent condition effectively enables Rangitane to exercise kaitiakitanga in Kofata's patch. Potentially, that then opens the door for Rangitane to influence other planning processes and decisions in Kofata's tribal area. Not only does the whole cultural monitoring process become endangered, but future planning scenarios also become more complicated. I should note at this point that both AFCO and Ngāti Kaupata are members of the Manawatu River Leaders Forum. The forum is a collaborative group composed of diverse parties who have committed to improving the Modi or life force of the Manawatu River catchment. One of the goals of the forum is that waterways in the catchment are safe, accessible, swimmable and provide good recreation and food resources. Despite being members of the Manawatu River, Leader for, River Leaders Forum, AFCO has struggled and continues to struggle against Kofata and others to continue discharging into the Ōraua River. Interestingly, in their closing submissions in the consent hearing, they tried to use the social against us. For example, they argued that the project enhances the Modi of the Ōraua River. And to the degree Iwi want the Modi of the Wai absolutely protected, that is inconsistent with the One Plan's management objective of maintaining and enhancing the Modi. We express doubt that AFCO's continued discharge, albeit improved, would enhance the Modi to the extent that the people would use the river. The Planner for the Horizons Regional Council argued that the consent term is the only mitigating factor that would meaningfully address the contribution of the discharge to the alienation of the iwi from the awa. In response, AFCO argued that the planner's statement fails to recognise that AFCO is doing more than its fair share to improve water quality in the, in the river and to reduce spiritual effects, in particular by having an overland passage system. Again, we had to return to our position that regardless of the good work that AFCO has done to improve the discharge, the discharge will continue and possibly at higher volumes. Under those circumstances, it is highly unlikely that Kofata would ever use the river as a place of spiritual cleansing. AFCO also argued that removing the discharge completely from the river would force the plant to close down and Kofata's position would lead their own people to becoming unemployed. Recognising that the plant is an important local employer, we stressed that we wanted the plant to continue without compromising the river. AFCO's position, at least in my mind, was akin to economic blackmail. Effectively, they were saying to us, it's your jobs or your river. In January of this year, the com commissioners released their decision and granted AFCO a 12-year consent term until July 2029, consistent with the planner's recommendation. AFCO appealed the decision to the Environment Court on the basis of the term being too short. They sought again a 32-year consent term and the court directed them to consider mediation. Kofata and others enters, entered the proceedings as Section 274 participants. To date, we've had two mediation meetings with AFCO and AFCO are now pressing us for a 22-year discharge to river, and so the struggle continues. To close, I knew when I was writing the cultural impact assessment and before presenting the submission at the consent hearing that we could not win the fight by using the science. So my strategy was to go around the science and answer the question of what difference will removing the discharge from the river make with a social answer, which was, the people will use the river again. 
as long as the discharge to the river continues, regardless of what the science says about the nitrogen or the phosphorus or the E. coli being reduced by increased flow levels, the people won't use it. Indeed, as Ngata wrote so many years ago, we do and we must use the science as a tool, as a strategy to help us address the physical aspects of our well-being, whether that be in our bodies or in a river to which we are connected. But we must ground ourselves in our knowledge of our ancestors and of ourselves. It is our shelter, it is our foundation, it is where we are strongest. Nā reira, tēnā koutou katoa. So just for the recording, the question is about um, how we negotiated um, uh, another tribe coming into Kofata's um, area of mana whenua um, in the consent process um, and afterwards in the appeal process, which is where we think it has been worked out. So the situation with Rangipane is they're not the newcomers, they were there before. So their rohe um, uh, includes um, that fielding area. Um, so Kofata have been came into that area in about 1830 as a result of the heke, as a result of the migrations. Um, so um, and they have had uh, uh, they did negotiate um, a tato ponamu, a peace arrangement um, around that time uh, in the 19th century. Um, but <clears throat> how we worked it out, um, so it caused a lot of, had the potential to cause a lot of conflict. Um, Kaufata, as I understand it, weren't happy about um, Rangitane coming in using that doorway of the, um, of the consent process. Um, so in the appeals, um, Rangitane didn't participate as a Section 274 participant. So we were able to massage the conditions a little bit. So they will still be involved on a five yearly basis in the investigative review process where um, AFCO's uh, progress towards looking at other options for removing the discharge from the river are considered and put in front of Rangitane um, and Kofata. But we were able to include a consent condition around Kofata having a yearly, an annual report um, from AFCO, which keeps Kofata up to date with what's going on on a yearly basis um, and recognises their mana whenua in the fielding area. I hear what you're saying about the complications, um, for example, with regards to statutory acknowledgement areas coming out of treaty processes. So, for example, in the Manawatu District Council, uh, Rohe area, um, there are eight iwi um, and they are, they are trying to work out now um, how to, um, how to, how to do that, how to be able to engage with everyone appropriately but not get into the situation where they are setting up culturally unsafe processes um, but being unaware about that. Yeah, so that was how we did it. We we did it in the in the appeals process by re, by negotiating additional conditions um, that enabled Ngāti Kofata's mana whenua in the fielding area just across the road from the AFCO plant to be recognised. Offline, offline, we've had uh, conversations. Um, so I'm acting for Kofata. I'm not Kofata. But we've had conversations um, amongst ourselves about potentially talking with um, some of the leadership in Rangitane about how can we make this cultural monitoring situation work um, so that um, we're not treading on each other's turf. Yeah. So yeah. So one way was through the conditions in the appeal process, renegotiating of oh, negotiating additional ones, and the second way was through having offline conversations and corridor about how can we make it happen, yeah, Gilda. So the question is, how do you, is it, it's sort of around, uh, who do you talk to? Yeah, yeah who, do you, who do you talk to? Yep, yep, 
yeah, who do you talk to um, uh, in order to um, find out um, the history um, associated with the particular place that you are investigating. Um, so I think the, pl the place to come back to is knowledge of the tribal landscape. Um, yeah, the place to come back to is knowledge of the tribal landscape. Um, and you're a scientist, so you understand the whakapapa, the genealogy of things, right? You understand... Or you understand in the science... You understand it in a scientific sense, though. So, um, so things come from a source, a particular origin, um, and there are, there are different layers. Um, and the same is true for the tribal landscape. Um, uh, there's an origin, and there are different layers. And what you have to do in, able, in order to be able to sensitively um, walk on that landscape is to understand that landscape um, uh, from a tribal perspective. So I understand that you've got some really good people here in the council um, who can help you start on that process, on that journal, oh, ju aroha mai, not journal, journey, um, of understanding that tribal landscape. It takes a long time. Um, it, it, can take, it can take years, but the important thing is that you start um, and then you start filling your own kitty of knowledge, your own basket of knowledge about um, the history of this place um, in a tribal sense. Um, so yes, there will be layers of people coming into that space um, and going out of that space. But we have to start as really understanding uh, that tribal landscape, yeah. Yeah, so is the question around how do we build, some, build understanding, um, for example, between mātauranga Māori and science, in order to be able to come respectfully and sensitively into um, the type of work. Sorry, I'm, I didn't get your name. Yeah. That Sarah is doing. Um, so I think part of it is about um, Sarah, for example, um, and scientists like Sarah um, being able to come to people like you, um, Etifaya, um, to say, hey, I'm doing this work here, but I don't know the history and the stories about this particular place. How can I find out about that? Um, so that's, is that, that's the first thing, is knowing who to come and talk to, and that accord it all needs to happen. Um, in the first place. Um, the, the second thing is in the, as you say, you're in the business of trying to build a bridge um, so that um, uh, the mana whenua, the people that have, um, uh, that have authority in that particular place um, so that their aspirations and interests can be recognised um, consistent uh, with, for example, um, Council's Māori Responsiveness Plan you're in the business of building those bridges and so and part of that is in the translation. So how do you translate to someone like Sarah and her colleagues, how do you translate and talk about um, this landscape, this tribal landscape in a way um, uh, that someone like Sarah and her colleagues can understand? So that's the second thing is the translation. The third thing, um, and um, me and my old friend Tala talked about this before, um, is that recently I understand that Professor Sue Mason Jury has developed three new treaty principles that I think are useful in the situation that you're talking about. So he wrote the three P's, partnership, protection and participation, um, and he's recently come up with the three E's, which are education, encouragement and enlightenment. Yeah. So I think the education is around understanding, well part of it is around understanding the tribal landscape and helping um, people like Sarah to, to understand that. Um, the second part is encouraging, okay, encouraging that learning to happen so that she feels cool and comfortable with it um, and so that you also um, feel like, um, um, oh man, this isn't such a hard, you know, this isn't such a hard slog, there's some, there's some, um, there's some learning and some understanding happening here. And then the third one is about enlightenment and, oh, yeah, um, at some point in the process, um, the penny drops um, 
and there's some understanding and enlightenment, enlightenment which translates into practice on the ground. Yeah. Kia ora. Oh, tēnā koe punati. Kia ora. I just wanted to acknowledge, particularly um, with what, what Sarah put forward, mm. um, when someone's going through that, yep. it's, you think it's the first time mm. or you're the only one, but as Sarah shared her example, I was kind of excited because I can count five times where I've been a mana whenua yep. hui with council and where that's happened. And it was really quite simple. Mm. I mean, all, all I saw was we looked at each other, looked at us and says, Taiwo, we need 20 minutes. Yeah. And all we did is all the council staff in the room is like, oh yeah, sure. We all got up and left the room. And they had their cordial and then they called us back in. And when we back, went back in, they told us, oh, this is how it's going to roll. Yep, yep. So, so what was neat was, it's, um, and you know, that's what I think is the real excitement about the role that we have all as council staff working together is that it's new for everyone. But that's where the excitement lies. Is that I, I look back now based on what Sarah said because I thought that was normal now because I didn't know any different. But what I realise is now more and more now I'm, I'm meeting different people from different technical capability who are hitting that wall. Mm. And what they need to hear is they need to hear, oh, kids, what? There's, there's ways around that. Yep. And, if, and look, we're still making those mistakes. Yeah. And, and I think the thing is recognised, and that's where I've seen my best learnings come from when we've made these mistakes. A big fire has erupted and we had to run around. But the thing to remember is to stop, have a look at what happened afterwards and, and do an honest review. I think that's the biggest challenge. It's very difficult for us with the council sometimes to do an honest review. Yeah. Where it's not, it's just trying to avoid the... So often I've had to say, not a criticism, just an observation. Yeah. You know, and, and just, it's like you were saying, create a safe ground for all of us to, to work and navigate, I suppose. Yeah. But it is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is new for some. It is new for some, but these things can be learnt, um, and it starts somewhere. And it can be a twenty-minute corridor conversation with the people who are from that place and know that place, know the histories and the corridor. Um, and this is this is can be tricky terrain, terrain to negotiate this um, tribal landscape. And I've made mistakes, and I still make mistakes. I still put my foot in it, um, but and I've had to look at myself and say to myself, "Oh, you know, you know, you messed up there, girl." Um, but yeah, and that's hard to do, and that's hard to do. But um, that's how the learning happens is in the reflection. A eh? yeah. So for anyone who's out there who's been listening to this cordial and listen to this ex- to this exchange. Um, uh, and it's feeling like they don't know anything, um, but they've been working in a situation where they have to find out. You can, you, it's a learning, like anything else, and you can learn about this landscape. You'll make mistakes, I'm not going to lie, um, even if you've been working in the area for a long time, but it's okay. It's okay. Yep. Um, so the question is... Um, what was the involvement of the Crown or local government um, in this p- process involving um, AFCO and Ngāti Kauwhata and others? Um, and to be honest, um, we didn't have much involvement um, with the Regional Council until the appeals process. Um, I think they really wanted us to talk with AFCO. They really wanted Kofata to talk with AFCO and for us to try and nut it out between ourselves, um, the, um, the term and the conditions of, this, of these consents. There were five of them. So, I, so they really wanted us, I think that they really wanted us to do that. So to be honest, they were really um, in the background. Um, in the consenting in the appeals process again, um, they and the commissioner that we've been working with have been really saying to us, "Okay, we need to work this out through corridor, through conversation. You guys continue talking to each other, which hasn't really, which hasn't been an easy thing. It's been quite challenging, particularly as these struggles have been going on. 
um, in the consent pro in the hearing process as well as in the appeals process. So that's really where the regional council um, has been. Um, in terms of the crown, let's say um, the commissioners, their decision we were happy with and we were pleasantly surprised that they granted a, what was effectively a 12-year term. Um, so we've taken some confidence from that. Yeah, but really it's, it, but really a lot, it's been between Kofata, the other Section 274 participants who um, are envi environmental groups, um, and AFCO. Mm. Regional Council has really kind of been in, in the background or in, in a back seat. Yeah. Well, they they recommended that the consent term was the only mitigating factor um, in regards to um, uh, was the only was the only factor that would mitigate uh, the continued alienation alienation of the iwi from the river. Yeah. In a conversation that that she and I had over the, um, over the phone, she sort of had sort of landed on around about fourteen years. Yeah, and then the commissioners um, uh, the commissioners landed on an expiry date for the consent uh, being twenty twenty nine. We've got common catchment expiry dates. Um, uh, and 2029 is one of them, so that's where they, that's where the commissioners landed, and the cons the planners' recommendation was fairly close to that. It strikes me as quite surprising, considering the significant cultural impacts here, that the, that the regional council can play a strong role in developing into those cultural issues and to get to position and form the regulation that the. Uh, the, the terms of the, the expiry of the consent, it just seems to put the quite a weak position to say you guys sort it out. That's what I'm hearing from. Yeah, that's not a question that I can answer. Um, you'd have to talk to, um, to their planner on that one and their people on that one. Um, but I'll be honest, this, the sense that I got from uh, the hearing process and from the commission, from conversations with that planner um, and from uh, the decision that the commissioners made was that it wasn't that the cultural the, the cultural impact of the discharge was a significant factor but it wasn't really that we won the fight it was more that AFCO had lost it because they didn't provide sufficient evidence to support their position that a reduced consent term would close them down. They didn't provide enough economic analysis to support that position. So it wasn't really that we had won the fight, it was more that they had lost it. Mm. The other thing I just wanted to check was in terms of the questioning from the commissioners, did you get a sense that it was very science centric type questioning or were they um, the sense that I got from the commissioners during um, when we were um, presenting our submissions was that <clears throat> they were really focused on how we're going to mitigate the impacts of this discharge for you. Yeah, how are we going to mitigate the impacts of this discharge for Ngāti Kofata? So there was a lot of questioning around, for example, the overland passage system that AFCO were proposing to install. Um, so we came away from that not feeling very confident, actually, that we were going to get a consent term that was close to what we wanted. Um, yeah, so that's where, their, that's where their questioning was around. Before we submitted, um, a lot of the questioning was about the nitty-gritty of the science. Yeah. Thank you.